Good evening, everyone. My name is Kay Ball. I'm a member of the Greater Shepparton Heritage Advisory Committee. And uh, we warmly welcome you this evening. It's been a very cold day. It's lovely to see that people are willing to be out and about. We've had a, an excellent session at one o'clock today and very good at attendance. And uh, everyone commented how much they en enjoyed the session. And as it's a repeat this evening with Evan, I'm sure you will also find it uh, of great enjoyment. And this is uh, the biennial Bruce Wilson Memorial Lecture that is arranged by the Heritage Advisory Committee with support from Greater Shepparton Council. Just to let you know, this session is being recorded and will be available via the Council website with a link to YouTube. So you can um, have another look or recommend it to friends if you wish. Some housekeeping items, um, hand sanitizers available on the tables if you need to use it, although as you've already had a snack, I think I might be a bit late with that announcement. The uh, toilets are to the right of the uh, main door coming from Wellsford Street entrance. And if you could just uh, practice uh, common sense social distancing where possible. We welcome our Mayor, Mayor Shane Sarley, and also our Deputy Mayor, Anthony Brophy, we're expecting. Yes, hello, Anthony. Councillor Greg James and Councillor Fern Summer. I can't spot any other councillors. Have I missed any? Greg James, I said yes. Good. We have some apologies. Wendy Mulrooney, Andrea Metcalf. Mark Gepp, Wendy Lovell, Susanna Sheed, Jenny Houlihan and Tim Quilty apologised. I'd like now to introduce you to Auntie Faye Lynham and Auntie Faye will give us the welcome to country from the Yorta Yorta Nation. Thank you. Back again. Welcome everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting on today, Yorta Yorta Nations, elders, past and present, and emerging. Now, it might be my culture to welcome you all here to a land, but it's also history of Australia, my history and your history, our history together. And it's important, and this heritage thing is absolutely wonderful. And you will all enjoy it, because I loved it today. OK. The Mayor, thank you for being here. Greg, Fern and Anthony, I welcome us all here. Thank you. Right, well, we'll welcome our Mayor, Shane Sarley. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Kay, and um, Auntie Faye is right, we are back. Auntie Faye and I did the lunchtime session as well, so it is good to be back, but we get a bit of food this time, didn't we? I missed out on that earlier, so. Um, and thank you so much for that welcome as well, very good. Uh, as I mentioned, it is good to be back and welcome you all here for the annual Greater Shepherd and Bruce Wilson Memorial Heritage Lecture. I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Evan Lloyd who many of you know, but if not, we'll get to know no doubt by the end of this session. Evan will be introduced shortly by Marjorie, who's on Council's Heritage Advisory Committee. Is that right? Yeah. Because Jeff is here, but um, he's unable to speak at the moment. So I do welcome Jeff here as well. To begin though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners that we, Greater Shepparton City Council, acknowledge the Yorta Yorta peoples of the land which now comprises Greater Shepparton we pay respect to their tribal elders, we celebrate their continuing culture, and we acknowledge the memory of their ancestors. I know it's already been done, but I too would like to acknowledge my fellow councillors in the room this evening, our Deputy Mayor, Anthony Brophy, and Councillors Greg James and Councillor Fern Summer. Council are extremely pleased to have heritage enthusiast Evan Lloyd deliver this year's lecture on the life and work of James Augustus Kenny Clark. I said that earlier, so I think I've got it right again, so. <laughs> Clark is often referred to in relation to the buildings in Shepparton, however, not much else is known about him. 
Many of the buildings designed by Clark, which are still in extinct, e existence today, are included in the heritage overlay. They are seen as a part of the cultural heritage of Greater Shepparton and therefore deserve to be retained. We all know that Greater Shepparton has a rich cultural heritage. Many of these significant places address the things that make Greater Shepparton unique. Some of those include the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history of our region, our agriculture and industrial history, and our migrant history and experiences. This is our culture, cultural heritage. It embodies our history and our story. It reminds us of what is important to our community and what we have all inherited. Council is working proactively in the heritage awareness and conservation space, and we are pleased to say our work hasn't gone unnoticed. Some of you might be aware, but if not, Greater Shepparton was recently acknowledged by the Heritage Council of Victoria to be at the forefront of municipal heritage awareness in the state. Today's lecture is one aspect of that awareness, as are the very successful Cultural Heritage Awards and our ongoing Heritage Open Days. Greater Shepparton also offers grants for conservation works to owners of properties with the heritage overlay, making us one of the tiny minority of progressive councils in Victoria. Once again, I would like to thank you all for attending this evening's Bruce Wilson Memorial Heritage Lecture. I would particularly like to thank and acknowledge the Greater Shepparton Heritage Advisory Committee for all the work you have done in being able to facilitate this evening's event. Thank you so much and thanks for having me here tonight. So. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. And thank you for mentioning the Heritage Advisory Committee. Um, the people that sit on that committee are all volunteers and put in a lot of time and effort and hours. And we capture an enormous amount of local knowledge through the people that sit around that table. It's a very um, uh, wonderful experience, I know it has been for me, to be connected with that committee. We'll now um, ask Marjorie Earle, as Secretary of the Heritage Advisory Committee, who will introduce Evan to you. Thank you. It is with much pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce to you Evan Lloyd, who will present the 2022 Bruce Wilson Memorial Heritage Lecture. You'll be interested to hear that Evan was an inaugural member of the, as a community represent on the Greater Shepparton Heritage Advisory Committee when it formed in 2012, and we greatly benefited from his knowledge and expertise until April 2019. Evan was 11 years old when his family moved into the property known as Fairley Downs, which is nine kilometres north of Shepparton. It was the home site of the original squatting, squatting run north of the Broken River, known for many years as Taligarupna, and it retains many features of local historic importance. These include an 1840 slab hut connected with Sherborne Shepherd and a large homestead designed by the prominent local architect, J.A. Clark. Evan describes it as a wonderful place in which to grow up with the Goulburn River, its own small cemetery, and an old Model T Ford rusting away in a billabong. At university, Evan studied architecture and was to be the fourth generation on his mother's side to do so. He completed three years with a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture. Then he studied Cultural Heritage Management, another degree. During his studies, he researched local topics, such as the now dem demolished Old Shire Hall in Nixon Street and architect J.A.K. Clark. His mother, Heather, did study architecture but didn't register because she married. And of course, back in that time when you married, you didn't get employed. And Evan's eldest son is now studying architecture and building at Deakin University. Evan returned to the property 24 years ago to manage the farm and sees one of his roles as protecting its history for the future. And he often hosts groups visiting the property. Though now he calls himself simply a farmer with a lifestyle he says that suits him more than architecture, 
Evan is proud to be asked to present the Bruce Wilson Memorial Heritage Lecture this year, and he will discuss the career of J.A. Clark Clark, whose building remains a major part of our district. Over to you, Evan. <laughs> Hello everybody and thanks for coming along. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the Elders, past, present and emerging and thanks to Auntie Faye for welcoming us today. I'd also like to acknowledge Bruce Wilson after whom this lecture is named. I met Bruce many times growing up but it wasn't until later when he was the inaugural chairman of the Heritage Advisory Committee and I was a community member on it and there I learned to fully appreciate his love of our history and his passion for communicating our stories. And my father considers Bruce a good friend, so I am honoured. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Heritage Advisory Committee, especially Marge Earl, Anne Tyson and Rob Slee, who after many attempts have persuaded me to talk today. They're very tenacious. So please forgive me if I appear unprofessional, because I am. But let's start the story. <clears throat> now, uh, we're talking about John Augustus Kenny Clark, and I may refer to him at times simply as J.A.K. I'll always also use imperial measurements as I talk about his buildings, such as feet and inches, because that's what he designed in. But as a rough guide for younger people, 10 feet is about three metres. J.A.K. Clark's father was called John Clark, a solicitor practising for a time on Victoria Parade in the firm Ross and Clark. His mother was Lucy Letitia Kenny, the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel Eyre Evans Kenny of Camp Hill in Mooney Ponds. The couple were married in December 1848 at St James Cathedral and were living in Collingwood. J.A.K. was born at the top end of Collins Street near Treasury Gardens in Melbourne on April the 19th, 1852. Unfortunately, his dad died suddenly in 1862 and he had a younger sister named Fanny, an accomplished porcelain painter who died young at the age of only 26. A highlight of his early life was that he rode on a camel, which is part of the Burke and Wills expedition, as it headed north from Royal Park in June 1860. <clears throat> Those of you who know the story know that the expedition got off to a bad start, with wagons breaking down before they got very far. And they camped at Mooney Ponds. Clark's grandfather, Lieutenant Colonel Kenny, had met Burke previously and had invited him to his property. So perhaps someone who knows the story better than I do can explain to me if they actually did camp at his grandfather's property and if that's where he rode the camel. After school, Clark served for five years with the English architects and this would have been the traditional master apprentice system where admission to the Institute of Architects was achieved by serving articles under a registered architect. Apprentices were commonly instructed in two professions, either as architect engineer or, as Clark did, as architect surveyor. He probably also attended classes at a mechanics institute or art school to study subjects such as drawing, engineering or architectural history. Clark's obituary says of his apprenticeship that he was taught not to bother with fancy plans but rather to create light and airy rooms and to be above all else accurate in his drafting. He clearly followed this advice as years later a local builder said that in a two-storey building Clark's plan wouldn't be out an inch. So with his articles complete Clark began a career as a draftsman in the expanding railways network. He first worked for the Melbourne and Hobson's Bay Railway Company which was then purchased by the Victorian government in 1878. He is listed in the Government Gazette as a draftsman in the engineering branch right up till 1890, the year he moved to Shepparton. Now, it appears that he didn't work on the Shepparton and Newmerka lines, which were opened in 1880 and 1881. However, he did spend some time surveying on the Dukey Railway line, which was being built in 87 and 88. He had been visiting his future in-laws, the Masons, when he was persuaded to work on the new line as, an end, as a surveyor for a period. He returned to Melbourne upon completion. The world that Clark grew up in were the heady days of gold rush Victoria and a booming Melbourne. He was born one year after the discovery of gold and in those first 10 years Victoria's population blew, uh, grew from 77,000 to 540,000. 
And by the 1880s, Melbourne was described as one of the world's great cities and was dubbed marvellous in 1885 by a visiting British journalist. <clears throat> a major part of Clark's early life in Melbourne was his love of the revolutionary new invention, the bicycle. And one of his stories claims that he was the first in the colony to ride a safety bicycle in 1874. While this seems a bit too early for the true safety bikes that became a commonplace in the 1880s, it probably refers to the penny farthing, which are a major improvement on earlier bikes. He may have been in some form of partnership with his friend and fellow bike nut Harry Baggett, importing these new penny farthings. Clark and Baggett became features on Melbourne's growing cycling events scene. And in November 1878, Clark won a three-mile handicapped event at the MCG where his riding style was described as far from elegant, but he was a good one to go. Clark was important to the founding of the Melbourne Bicycle Club in 1878, and the club organised social riding events, competitions, and brought cycling to the public. The club created what is now the world's oldest handicap track race, the Austral Wheel Race. And this year, in 2022, will be the 124th running. It was originally held at the MCG and was a massive success with crowds of 30,000 people, and Clark is described as being the judge of the 1887 event. In 1881, a description of one of the annual meetings of the club says, the Mr. Turner, on behalf of the members of the club, presented to the captain, that's Clark, a silver stopwatch as a token of the kindly feeling of the members and the appreciation of the captain's invariable urbanity, his tact and skills as captain, and his active and well-directed zeal in connection with the affairs of the club and bicycling generally. Now, his love of the bicycle may have also led Clark to meeting the love of his life and the reason that he moved to Shepparton. At a bike race in 1878 at the MCG, Clark came second, and A.B. Mason, his future brother-in-law, came third. The A.B. stands for Arthur Burdekin. His brother, A.C. Mason, the A.C. standing for Asline Coslet, also raced bikes. And now, some of you may know that the Mason family were important to the growth of orchards and irrigation in this part of the district. After Alfred Leahy, another important early figure, died suddenly in 1880, the Masons took over the well-regarded property known as Shepparton Park, some 900 acres to the north of Knight's, Knight Street, which was then the northern edge of the town. Their relative Edward Lightfoot also had substantial lands to the town's north. And the Masons went on to establish some 200 acres of orchard and vineyard, and in 1893 they were first to do irrigation using a steam engine pump from the Goulburn to irrigate an orchard of about 90 acres around where we now call Balaclava Road. They were described as enterprising tillers of soil and the government encouraged other landholders to, to emulate them. Beatrice Mary Mason was the youngest daughter of H.W. Mason and Annie Lightfoot. While her brothers are riding bikes with Clark, it would seem Beatrice is riding horses. She is often described as an excellent horse horsewoman and adept at side saddle riding, and throughout their lives, Beatrice and J.A.K. were known for the quality of their horses and their love of low back sulky carts. J.K. and Beatrice were married on January the 13th, 1890 at St Martin's Anglican Church in South Yarra, and they lived at a house called Tolano on Williams Road in Windsor. As described in Clark's obituary, soon after the wedding, the newlyweds made a big decision. A.B. Mason urged Mr. Clark to chuck up the railways and start an orchard at Shepparton. To Mr. Clark's surprise, his wife consented on one condition, that the house to be erected was not weatherboard. That was in the winter of 1890 when they set out on their journey to Shepparton in their own American buggies with Mrs. Clark driving one and her husband driving the other. Fortunately, Beatrice was so taken with the climate that she had no desire to return to Melbourne, so they disposed of their Melbourne home. And their move out of Melbourne seems well-timed as the economy soon nosedived into the great 1890s depression and Melbourne was hit hard by the massive downturn. So now we have Clark in Shepparton in 1890, but before we move on to his architectural career, I'd like to raise some other aspects of his life, which goes to demonstrate what a valued member of the local community he was, right up to his death. First was his love of horticulture. He went on to establish at Nettlegoe's property a large orchard of apples, peaches, cherries, apricots and oranges, and a vineyard. It was said that, along with the Mason's farm, that they provided most of the town's produce requirements for some years. 
Oh. Oh. Uh, sorry. Here we go. This is an article in 1892 which describes uh, Nettlego, his property. Mr. Clark very dro kindly drove me around in his sulky, driving a splendid trotting pony, Copper, capable of doing his mile in a fraction over three minutes. Mr. Clark had lately erected a very handsome brick residence with every convenience and evidently intends to make shepherd in his home. He experienced a little difficulty in clearing nettles from the land and succeeding has appropriately named his estate Nettle Go. So here we have the story behind the property's name. Sometimes you can see it's spelled with a C as in Nettle Co, but it's most definitely with a G, Nettle Go. <clears throat> he immediately joined the Shepherd and Agricultural Society and throughout his remaining years was a staunchest member and supporter, claiming that up to his retirement, he never missed a meeting. He was a long-term office bearer in the society. As a horse lover, he advocated for trotting competitions and for many years acted as chief steward and timekeeper at the Shepparton Jockey Club. He was also a member of the Shepparton Sports Carnival Committee and Horticultural Society. The list goes on. His affability was often spoken of. He was known to produce laughter in otherwise boring committee meetings. The following is a description of Clark given years later by Jock McNeil, a coach builder who had worked with JAK. I soon learned that the Clark family were the aristocrats of Shepparton. I can recall Mr. Clark, his wife, and two daughters going on their Sunday outings, riding their horses into town. And the horses were the type you'd see on Melbourne Cup Day. Beautiful animals. In fact, everything the Clark did was with class. They were a very good living family, and they always looked, dressed, and acted in a very top class manner. Okay, well, we should start talking about architecture. <clears throat> In this late Victorian period, architectural decisions revolved around which style to apply to a, bu a building. These styles included, but weren't limited to, Italianate, Gothic, Romanesque, Tudor, Queen Anne, or Classical. And so depending on the client or the building type, the architect would apply one style or even a combination of styles. And this could lead to statement buildings with lots of different features. Two important, important early figures in the colony were William Wardle, who designed the Gothic Revival style, and J.J. Clark, no E on the end, who used the classical style in public buildings such as Treasury Place. Now, it's important to note the difference between J.J. Clark, no E on the end, and J.A.K. Clark with an E on the end. If you type architect and J. Clark into Google, and you aren't careful about that spelling, you might think that J.A.K. designed a lot of those impressive Melbourne buildings such as the Royal Mint. <clears throat> Architects more contemporary with Clark include Pitt, Koch, Salway, Taylor and Kilburn. Between them are many of the period's best known buildings. And as we move through his career, we start to see newer styles such as English Arts and Crafts, American Shingle and Art Nouveau as we move into the Federation and Edwardian periods. A local contemporary architect is Tom Gaylor's Arthur Edgar Castles, who did many buildings in the same era, but they're mostly west of the Goulburn River. It was also a time of improvements in building techniques, better quality bricks, cast iron, plaster, paint, and stucco. And we also see the arrival of bigger plate glass windows, reinforced concrete, electricity, cavity brick walls, interlocking roof tiles, and the increased mechanization of all aspects of life. So, what was Shepparton like in 1890? When Clark moved to Shepparton, the town was start starting to become an important regional centre. In 1873, only 13, she only 13 families lived in Shepparton, but then industries such as the Furfy Foundry and Swallows Mill were established, the railway opened, and the promise of irrigated agriculture with the building of the Goulburn Weir at Nagambi. By 1888, Shepparton had four banks, a shire hall, a post office, a mechanics institute, five churches, two newspapers, and a farming district which was known for its great wheat production and the beginnings of the fruit industry. And so when JAK and Beatrice arrived in 1890, there were about 1,500 people, some 400 buildings, and the, uh, the streets were very much based on Alfred Leahy's 1874 survey. So if his, oh gosh, this is very touchy. There we go. 
Oh, dear. <laughs> dear me. All right. I'll just stay there for a second. On that previous map, the top line was Knight Street. That was very much the boundary of the town as it existed back then. So anyway, let's move on, because here we are at the next slide, and this is Nettlego. As promised, here's the first house. So this is Nettlego, which is, off, which is on Clark Court, just off Verney Road. But back then, it was set on a growing orchard about a mile northeast of town. The speed with which Nettlego and its neighbouring house Ivanhoe attended, contracted and built demonstrates just how ready and excited Clark was for his new life. The contract for Nettlego was signed in August 1890 within months of their arrival and the house was finished in April 1891 for the cost of about a thousand pounds. R.F. Simmons was the builder. There we go. Um, now, about 30 years ago, when I first did some research on Clark, we were lucky enough to get the, uh, to see the original drawings, contract and specifications for Nettlego. And on the table there are copies that we made, although they're fairly rough copies. So if the originals ever turn up again, it would be great to make better versions of them. Now, if you've ever watched Grand Designs, or if you know any architects, you'll know that young architects love to go all out on their own homes or those of close relatives. Either way, it's a compliant client. My grandfather was a young architect who travelled through Europe in the early 1930s and he was taken by the new trends in modernism and came back to design a house for his brother in Geelong along these modernist lines. And that house is still there and it's very cool. So, similarly, J.K. JK wanted to show off his flair and innovation to please Beatrice but also to impress his new family and community. The house he built for Beatrice was a playful little Italian brick villa with a rustic gothi gothic entry and gables projecting west and south. Its front gable has decorative barge boards and a bay window and the veranda had large cast iron freezers and brackets and cast iron decorations along the ridges. And the chimneys were fine and well moulded. Large rounded coins at each corner and tuck pointing on the brickwork. The south facing gable has a large triangular aedicle over the window, but Clark's favourite feature was a 10 foot tall spire above the entry porch, which can be seen in that cross section. As a present to his wife, Clark built an extensive cellar so that she could escape the heat of summer. The main room in the cellar is 18 by 14 foot with a 12 foot ceiling, so that's a substantial room. It has a fireplace, a pair of windows looking into a light well on the south, in the well-protected south side, and it was used extensively as both a dining room and a sitting room. So if you see down there, that's into the light well into the cellar on the south side of the house. Unfortunately, in early 1914, a tornado swept through North Shepparton doing extensive damage. The Clarks were lucky to escape ex a serious injury as the roof and veranda were lifted, three chimneys were toppled, and worst of all, the spire was destroyed. A heartbroken Clark couldn't bring himself to rebuild the spire, instead replacing it with the battlements on the parapet that we see there. Oops. Nor did he replace the front veranda and the chimneys were rebuilt thicker and more robust. So the house we have today is still very decorative, but it's without some of its most prominent design features. The tornado also, it seems, affected the inside. The two front rooms and part of the hall have retained their original pressed tin ceilings and cornices, and the hall has retained its decorative classical columns and arches, and that front bay room is a wonderful space. But in other parts of the house, the ceiling is plastered with simple cornicing. A few years later, Clark built an impressive stables for his beloved horses. It was said that all the other horses were envious of the Clark's horses, who had better quarters than theirs. And those stables were removed in the 1950s. And I'd like to thank the Thompsons for allowing me to visit. <clears throat> Just to the north of Nettlego is its sister house called Ivanhoe, built for A.B. Mason. 
It's less delicate than Edelgo and has two large gables projecting west and north. The gable ends have decorative timber work and barge boards and the large end windows have an impressive classical motif around them. The OG profile verandas have cast iron friezes, brackets, columns and decoration along the ridge lines. The brickwork was tuck pointed and was English bond, which is the alternating of headers and stretches. A large front room for many years housed a full-size billiard table, but was later divided into two bedrooms. The interior doesn't have pressed metal ceilings, but plaster ceilings with large curved plaster cornices and ceiling roses. It's a bit hard to tell, but these might date from that later alteration. Ivanhoe has a cellar space almost identical, oops. Ivanhoe has a cellar space almost identical to Nettlego. In fact, cellars are a feature of many Clark houses, though those of Nettlego and Ivanhoe are the most impressive. To deal with encroachment of water, the, pro the owner, the, the most properties owners have had to install a sump well and a pump. If you see down the bottom there, you can see some of the damage to the plasterwork. So it's a constant problem. I'd like to thank the tailors for allowing me to visit. So, now, in 1891, Clark has built his display homes to demonstrate his prowess and his orchard is becoming established. Shepparton is a growing town, although the 1890s depression had an effect everywhere. So, it wasn't until 1900 that his career really took off and he seems to have been very busy through to 1920, after which time, in his 60s, his output slowed. And as here, I'd like to acknowledge Jeff Alamein from Shepparton Heritage Centre and Lost Shepparton for sharing with me his list of potential Clark sites to complement my own. Uh, much of what we know come from tender notices and articles in newspapers, and Jeff has done a lot of that work, and I thank him. He also let me raid the photo collection. Now, where possible, I've used photos contemporary with Clark's work, uh, so we, it isn't affected by later editions. Between 1892 and 1935, there are some 100 projects which can be attributed to Clark. Now, as many jobs wouldn't have gone through the tender process or have a mention in the paper, there would have been uh, many more than that, uh, at least possibly many more than that. Now, not all of those are complete buildings. Some were alterations or additions, big or small. And some, like this, were surveying or engineering jobs. This is the stabilising of the river bank at the Shepparton Brewery in Wellsford Street after flooding in 1904. Of course, some of the buildings have been lost, whether to progress or fire, and some have been radically altered, so it is hard to tell what may have been the original works. <clears throat> this is the first tender we can find for Clark's career in July 1892. It's for the solicitor John Sutherland, who had arrived in Shepparton in 1887, and interestingly, later in 1921, he went into partnership with Frank Cameron, and so what we know today as Cameron's lawyers effectively dates back 155 years. Whilst I'm not certain, but I'm thinking, and Joy Thompson gave me this idea, that uh, it was probably located in, Fry's, in Fraser Street, opposite what is now the Observation Tower. Now, as we move through Clark's career, I'll group the buildings by type, and since we've started with an office, let's continue with offices and shops. One of his first projects was a new building for the Shepton News in High Street in 1893. The previous building had burnt down in a disastrous fire which had destroyed most of the plant and all records. Clark did some later additions to this building in 1902 before it itself was burnt down in 1951. Now here we're talking about that red building there. In August 19, 1896, we have a tender for the erection of shops for Mr. J. Stott. The Stotts were important to early Shepparton commerce and may have had numerous shop buildings. But we know at least one still exists on Wyndham Street, though it's undergone change. The parapet has lost some of its decorative features, the upper story windows have been bricked in, the veranda changed, and the name J. Stott is no longer visible, but that building's still there next to Tirana Walk. <clears throat> 
The Fairleys department store has undergone many changes in its history, so it's a bit hard to tell what's left. But James Fairley started trading in 1887 on High Street before purchasing the existing Getty store at its present location on Friars and Maud Streets in 1897. In 1903, Clark carried out extensive works to the Maud Street frontage and then, in 1906, carried out even more major works which made Fairley's Shepparton's largest store. I'm afraid I couldn't find a good photo from that period. After the railway arrived in 1888, Dookie became a bustling little town and Clark carried out a number of works there. These included alterations of a store in 1902, the erection of a brick shop in 1903, and then, as I believe this building is, he did additions to an existing building, possibly the old post office of 1878, for a new branch of the National Bank of Australasia. This building was replaced in 1938. In 1902, Clark designed a new fire station on a site in Maud Street behind what was then the post office. It cost 420 pounds and that was raised by donations and its construction was done with voluntary labour. Alterations were made in 1930, but then in 1968 the fire station was moved further south on Maud Street and Clark's building was demolished. Other shop works he carried out including, included repairs to the savings bank on Wyndham Street, alterations to the Star Theatre, repairs to the AMP building on Wyndham Street, works on the Paramount Theatre, and additions to the Union Motor Garage on Friar Street as late as 1926. Next, let's talk about churches. Clark's first local church work was to supervise construction of the St Mary's Catholic Church at Dookie in 1898, but he was not the design architect. His first church design was a little Presbyterian church in Kyola West, built in 1899. It was described as a neat wooden building of pretty design and reflects the greatest credit on the architect, Mr. J.A.K. Clark of Shepparton. The vestry and Sunday school were added later. It still exists and it's now been turned into a private home. <clears throat> on January the 19th, 1900, the original Catholic Church of 1879 on Knight Street got, was burnt down. The community was determined to rebuild with a grander building as quickly as possible. And in February, Clark was appointed architect for a church that could seat a congregation of 800. Fundraising immediately raised 1,000 pounds. The foundation stone was laid on July the 1st, 1900, and the new church opened on November the 11th. It was a substantial Romanesque style church with simple robustness and symmetry, buttressed walls and dorm events in its corrugated iron roof. It underwent further, uh, uh, quite a lot of alterations in 1924 to the form we know it today, where it has the twin spires and slate roof. Now, I like this picture. Oops, if I can go back to it. If you look behind it, that's Knight Street, or you see a paddocks. So it very much was the edge of town. Following quickly after St Brendan's, Clark designed a new Catholic church in New Merca. St John the Baptist opened in 1902. The building has an unusually lofty roof with a steep pitch and two rows of large ventilators. It was remarked at the time that every provision has been made to adapt the church to the hot climate. The builder was J.C. Duncan of Richmond and cost about £2,000 and Clark's name is on the foundation stone. <clears throat> In 1904, Clark was asked to design a new Methodist church at Tank Corner in Lemnos. It was built by Thomas Kittle, a well-known local builder with whom Clark did many projects. He did some further works on the church in 1917, but by the 1950s, congregation numbers had greatly reduced and the building was starting to deteriorate. Other church projects included alterations to the Presbytery and Dookie in 1902, brick extensions to the St Brendan's Convent in 1902, repairs to the Parsonage in Maud Street in 1904, and repairs to the Church of England in Dookie in 1918. Next, let's talk about schools and halls. In May 1901, Clark tended for a new primary school building at St Brendan's in Knight Street. It was to be 60 feet long, 21 feet wide, with 15 foot tall walls made of brick and plastered throughout. It had a fireplace and the ability to use partitioning to create separate rooms. 
Its opening coincided with the arrival of five Sisters of Mercy teaching nuns and classes began in February 1902. An initial enrolment of 44 pupils meant that the school had to be quickly doubled in size in 1903 and this served as a school till 1916. So here we're talking about the building on the right. In 1902, he designed the, the hall at Scott's Church in Friar Street, which was initially known as the Sabbath Sunday School. It has a pointed arch window form and buttressing along the walls, and it also has two rows of large ventilators near the ridge line, as we saw at St John the Baptist in Newmerca. He did later additions to the rear of the hall in 1909, and there is a foundation with his name on it. I'd like to thank Harold Dixon for giving me access. And Harold also gave me access to the Wesley Church on Ward Street, built in 1908. I was hoping this was a Clark building because I think it's a, a wonderful building, but uh, unfortunately it's not. It was designed by someone else. In 1902, Clark designed the meeting hall of the St George Lodge of Freemasons in Wellswood Street. Now this building has had many changes, so it's hard to recognize what it used to look like and I haven't found any early pictures. In 1905, Clark designed a new hall beside the old Mechanics Institute in Wyndham Street. It included the large hall, two rear storerooms, and two front offices. And for many years, the hall served as both a billiards room and then as the main community library up until about 1951. Now, on, if we're talking, that's the old Mechanics, that building there. So we're talking about this building here. The building has undergone various changes, particularly to its street frontage, so that now it's totally obscured. But internally, the hall retains its impressive timber-lined ceiling. In 1908, Clark submitted a design for the new Agricultural High School in Shepparton. It was to be part of a series of 10 such schools built around Victoria at the time in larger country towns where no free public higher education, uh, education existed. And from the age in July 1908 said, a design for the high schools of agriculture presented by Mr. John A.K. Clark of Shepparton have been so highly approved of by the Department of Agriculture that it has been adopted and Mr. Clark has been instructed by the department to call for tenders for the erection of high schools at Shepparton and Wangaratta. The Shepherd and Ag High on Friar Street was opened May 20th, 1909, with an initial intake of 33 pupils, and it was linked to a 56-acre farm on Old Dukey Road. Here is a description of the building from 1908. The architect, Mr J.K. Clark, has prepared a design that will provide ample accommodation for some time to come, with provisions for additions when rendered necessary. The foundations and present walls of the one-storey building are of such strength and dimensions that they will enable another storey to be added. The building consisted of classrooms and bathrooms for boys and girls, two laboratories, a master's room, dining room and storerooms. It had extensive verandas around both the, both the outside walls and also around an internal courtyard. Now, the extra story was never built. Rather, in 1937, a modern arts and crafts building was built next to it and a new school was built on the Verney Road, well, it's now Horden Street, site that exists today. The old school building continued to be used for some time for extra class space for night classes and was used for, for a time by the Air Training Corps during the Second World War. I believe it was finally demolished about 1980. Next, let's talk about pubs, wineries and breweries. The first iteration, now we're talking here, this building here on the corner. The first iteration of the Shepparton Hotel probably dates back to about 1873 on High Street, but located back at the Wellstead Street corner. In 1900, Clark designed a new building, which was a substantial one-storey brick structure that was wrapped around the corner of High and Wyndham Street. To avoid taxation on new buildings, a wall was built along High Street, linking the new building to the old as if it was just an addition. Again, we're talking this building here. In 1910, Clark added a second story for the owner, owner Maltby, with a substantial accommodation wing behind. It now had a first floor balcony and veranda and a decorative parapet. Internally, it had a fine large bar with cedar and hewn pine counters, brass rails, swing doors, and carry paneled ceiling. 
everything you'd like in a pub, but sadly we don't have it anymore. In 1900, Clark did additions to the Courthouse Hotel on Wyndham Street. Now, I'm not sure how major or minor the works were, but it's a good excuse to show you this picture of a pretty little pub that we lost. In 1902, he did major works on the Union Hotel on the corner of Morden Friar Street, which is now called the Hotel Australia. This probably included the addition of the second floor and balcony. He also did some works in 1905 at the Pine Lodge Hotel, but I'm unclear about the works and has been altered since. In late 1916, the old Terminus Hotel on High Street burnt down. There had been a pub on this site from the 1870s, originally known as Coglin's Hotel. The name was changed after the arrival of the railways. In 1916, when it burnt down, the owners were Brian and Scheel, who also owned the Shepparton Brewery and the Union Hotel. Clark's design included a strengthened structure required for a later second floor addition and space in the stairs for the foyer. Its facade was not overly decorative with a relatively simple parapet, presumably because the second floor was expected soon. It had a long right angle bar at the building's corner, a large dining room and kitchen off North Street, and along High Street was a large accommodation block of 17 rooms. The rear had a veranda and a glass conservatory space. Now this hotel was greatly altered internally and externally in 1938, with the second floor added in the Art Deco style we know today. I thank the Sainsbury's and Brooke Brazel for helping me find the one photo that exists showing this version of the Terminus. He also did later additions to the Victoria Hotel on Friar Street, and he built a brewery in Wangaratta in 1900 and carried out additions to the Shepparton Brewery in 1914. That could be a bit hard to read, but I'll tell you what it says. Uh, one of his first projects is a wine cellar at the Dukey Agricultural College in 1896. This building was not fully underground, but partly dug into the hill beside the vineyard. Now, it's described as having a Clark roof. Now, that's a Clark roof, no E on the end. What this means is unclear, but his next project may explain it better. In 1897, he designed a cellar for the Goulburn Valley Wine and Distillery Company, Company in Marupna. This is not the well-known Darvanese Excelsior winery, rather it was a cooperative which took grapes from about 40 small vignerons for processing, storage and marketing. The hope then was that the Marupnarad Mona region could rival Rother Glen and other warm climate wine areas. An article in 1898 said, Mr. J.A.K. Clark of Shepparton is the company's architect and, has been, and the work has been carried out with the completeness which marks all of Mr. Clark's work. This cellar was located close to the Marupna railway station. It's described as being 195 by 78 feet, so quite big, half buried into the ground with about five feet of wall exposed. It had a double skin roof. Its outer corrugated iron roof was painted white to reflect heat, and its second internal roof had a thick layer of swamp rushes for insulation. The walls had pine lining with rushes inside the cavity wall for further insulation. In 1901, Clark designed a crushing and fermenting plant at the site as well. Now, we'll move on to butter factories. It seems likely, through his links to the Shepparton and Agriculture Society, that Clark was involved with the works at the Shepparton Butter Factory from its creation in 1894. So, while I don't have firm proof, I think it's likely that Clark created this building. And such factories were quickly established in many local towns. And he is known to have designed such factories in Cobram in 1895, Boozy North in 1901, Pine Lodge in 1905, and Yamurka in 1907. Now, these would have included a cool room with, cav with timber cavity walls filled with charcoal for insulation, and again, double skin roofs uh, with ventilation to, for greater insula insulation value. Now, let's talk about the Shevin and Showgrounds. The Shepparton Agriculture Society was founded in 1877 and held its first show at this, in the same year at a site on the Goulburn River at the end of Nixon Street. <coughs> it moved to its current location for its 1899 show. Clark, who was active in the society, was responsible for the development of the new site over the next 20 years. To prepare for the 1899 show, he supervised the relocation of a grandstand from the Shepparton Racecourse, which was then located near the cemetery. 
And for the 1901 show, he supervised improvements to the grounds, construction of sheds, and of a dog and poultry display building. In 1902, the Australasian described the Shepparton Agricultural Show as one of the most important in rural Victoria. The showground is extensive and is being steadily brought up to date. The new buildings are skillfully designed by Mr. J.A.K. Clark to suit the purpose they have to serve. In 1906, he created a trotting track at the grounds, and then in 1911, he developed a planning proposal for the showgrounds to ensure its suitability for the next decade. These included a new grandstand, numerous other structures, fencing and gates. And there's the, show, the, the grandstand that was opened in October 1914. It was 101 feet long, 33 feet wide and 85 feet high at its peak. It was timber with some ironwork set on concrete foundations, had seatings for 600, catering facilities and a separate kitchen. The ground floor provided the society with a large banqueting room. It cost about a thousand pounds and was built very quickly in about 12 weeks. Now that's a picture of the Agricultural Society at that opening. And we have Clark sitting down there. There he is. It was described as a credit to the society and the town. At the opening, the Shepparton Advertiser pronounced it as an excellent and splendid building. Now we still have it today. And there it was being moved in 2005 during redevelopment of the site, but we've kept it. Now let's move on to the Maripna Hospital. Until about 1880, Maripna was a bigger town than Shepparton. So it isn't a surprise that the hospital was first located there. And as it grew, Clark was responsible for at least four buildings on the site. In 1898, planning began for replacement of the existing nine bed women's ward. Clark tended for the new ward in 1900 and was opened in July 1901. It was first called the Victoria Ward and later Ward 2. It consisted of two ward rooms, one 60 by 25 feet and the other 26 by 25 feet, a nurse's room and bedroom, storeroom and bathroom. You can see there above the veranda line are openings for greater ventilation. You see that white building there? The building's still there with some alterations over time, especially on its verandas, but it was largely untouched by the fire which destroyed most of the hospital. In 1907, Clark designed a new modern laundry for the hospital, and it was described as being 30 feet 6 inches, 45 feet of brick, with ample lighting on large windows. The front of the building is very neatly designed. The archwork over the door in plaster giving a quite a finished appearance. On either side of the door, large slate slabs have been let into the brickwork with the name of the donors filled in with lead. And the laundry is a great acquisition to our noble institution. Now this laundry was demolished in 1964, but the slabs with the donors' names, including Clark and many other local numeraries, luminaries, um, are still there at the Marupna Museum. Now here we're talking about this white timber building on the left. In uh, 1916, Clark was asked to design a new infectious diseases ward. So this is very pertinent to our COVID times. Along with Dr. Florence, he visited the Caulfield, Alfred and Fairfield hospitals in Melbourne to investigate the latest in design features of such wards. And the building was built by Thomas Kittle and opened in 1917. It's a timber structure of two six-bed wards with a central observation room with large glass windows to allow a nurse to observe all patients. It had lots of ventilation and protection against insects. The building came just in time to deal with a major influenza epidemic in 1917 and a diphtheria outbreak in 1918. The building was moved to a different site on the northwest of the site in 1924 and then later demolished. Now in this image you can see both the infectious diseases ward there and the Victoria ward there. In 1919 Clark carried out works on what was called the refractory ward. And this is where you lock up people who are a danger to themselves or to others. I'd like to thank Barry Campbell at the Marupna Museum for his help. Okay, now let's start talking about some houses. 
and that one most people might recognise as Ambermim. Of the 100 or so projects identified, some 20 were new home designs. We know he built houses on Correa Street, Friar Street, Wilson Street, Orr Street and Edward Street. He also built homes in Dunbalba Lane near Newmerca in 1895, Arcadia in 1902 and Dukey in 1905. But as I, said, uh, as I said before, there are likely to be more. And one aspect of Clark's career is that since his death, many buildings have been attributed to him. Some we are fairly confident of, such as Ambermere on Orr Street. Others, such as this house at 72 Correa Street, we may think, we, we think may be Clark houses, but we require further research. And then there are others, at 60, such as 64 Correa Street, which look like a Clark building, but can be credited to someone else. So to finish up my talk today, I'll just look at three homes which I'm sure were designed by Clark. In 1900, Clark designed the home known as Helson on Ford Road for, the Mason, for a Mason relative, possibly AB. The home was bought by the Ford family in 1910 and who were linked to the property for many years. It's an example of a Timber Federation homestead built around the central courtyard within which was a below ground water tank. It's a relatively simple structure, but which interestingly incorporates an old cool store room from the Shepherd and Butter factory. And this room, as I've described, has walls insulated this time with charcoal and a double skin roof with a ventilation space between. Its most dramatic feature is the timber geometric decorations along the veranda. When the current owners bought the property, these have been removed, but based upon an old photo, such as the one I just showed you, they were able to restore them to return the house to its ex original exterior design. This house is a simple storage cellar accessible from the courtyard, and I'd like to thank the Atleys for allowing me to visit. This, I think, is the prettiest home in Shepparton. It's called the Stott House at 84 Correa Street. In 1902, Clark designed this house for Mrs. Margaret Stott, who, along with the husband James, we mentioned before, as being important in local commerce. It was originally on a large block which went, which went back to Orr Street. It is a highly decorated timber structure with two projecting bays to the east and south. Its public-facing exteriors are clad in timberstone imitation, which would have been painted to enhance the effect. Its OG verandas have cast iron posts, decorative friezes and brackets, and its chimneys are fine with decorative tops. It retains much of its original slate roof. Entry was from beside the South Bay, and the central hall has an interesting Y form, where the hall angles towards the front room at 45 degrees and to the rear rooms at 90. The halls have plaster ceilings with large cornices and roses, and the house is a simple cellar. It looks like charcoal was used again as insulation in the wall cavities. Luckily, the owner discovered an original watercolored copy, original of the plans, and specifications hidden away in a hard to reach cupboard. I'd like to thank Joy for allowing us to have it today, as there it is on there on display. Finally, I'll talk about the house where I grew up in, now known as Fairley Downs. Hamilton Coldwell and his brothers were successful selectors around Telegroup and Zeros, north of Shepparton. And Hamilton became an important figure in the early days of Shepparton Shire when it separated from Echuca in 1879. And in 1902, he purchased the home site of the original Telegroup and Run and asked Clark to design a large mansion to express his pride with his excess. The result in 1905 was a late Victorian brick homestead of big proportions. It is built with garden wall brick bond, which is every fourth row is a header, with thick plaster internally. Now externally it's not as decorative as some other buildings and this might be because it was on a farm and so you weren't so worried about impressing the neighbours. It had an OG veranda with cast iron columns, freezers and brackets, has a simple timber decoration on its two eaves, small cast iron finials, finials and dormer vents on its roof. It has a large bay window in what was the front sitting room, and the formal entry has a large decorative cast iron lacework above it. But it was internally that the design features were more pronounced. 
The hall and rooms, the halls and rooms are large with pressed metal wonderlick ceilings of different patterns in every room and large pressed metal cornices. And the ceilings are 17 foot high. So it's wonderfully cool in summer, but very hard to heat in winter. The main room was used as a formal dining room by Cordwell and as a billiard room when owned by the Fairleys in the 1920s. This house is just a simple cellar. Once built, Caldwell renamed the property to simply the Homestead. So, as I alluded to before, many buildings have been attributed to Clark over the years. Now, this may be simply the result of him being such a prominent member of the community for so long. He may have even talked himself up a little bit. But I think we can safely say he was not involved with any local buildings before his arrival in 1890. So, this would mean that he didn't design the old post office of 1882, as is often stated, because he was still working on the railways. The same can be said of the Pines on Verney Road, which was built for the Swallows perhaps as early as the late 1870s. Also the Old Shire, build, the Old Shire Hall on Nixon Street, 1878, or the Mechanics Institute on Wyndham Street of about 1882. I've seen places that describe these buildings to Clark, but they can't be his. And other well-known buildings such as William Ward's Wanganui, they've been credited to other architects. Now this is not to downplay his importance, but I just wanted to say it because I've read it in lots of places. Okay, well I think my time is almost up, but I'd like to thank the building owners who have helped me and to the Heritage Advisory Committee for asking me to talk today. It's been great getting back into heritage research, but soon the weather will warm up and I'll have to get back to the farm. To anyone who thinks they have a Clark House, keep looking. Things like old titles are in the back of a hard to reach cupboard because you never know what you'll find. And hopefully we can keep adding to the list of Clark buildings. So to end, back to Beatrice and J.A.K. Their marriage was to last 53 years and gave them two daughters, Renee and Lucy. Beatrice died in, 18, in 1943, aged 81, and J.A.K. followed in 1945, the age of 93. They were buried side by side at the Shepparton Cemetery and their graves point straight back to their beloved house, Nettlego. Thank you. I'm sure we have enjoyed that. It's the second time I've heard that today and I enjoyed it just as much as I did at one o'clock. <laughs> There's so much information there. Um, I was able to take even more in tonight. Thank you, Evan. <clears throat> now, we do have some time if anyone has some questions they'd like to ask Evan. Anyone like to ask a question? <laughs> well, it was a very full address, so maybe he covered all the answers you might have had, wanted to ask, questions you might have wanted to ask. Terrific. All right. Well, we'll conclude our program. Well, thank you um, all for coming, and particularly our Mayor, Shane Sarley, and our councillors coming this evening, and Auntie... Faye Larnham, I think she slipped away home. And all of the members of the Greater Shepherd and Heritage Advisory Committee that are here this evening, and particularly the subcommittee that have put this program together. It's been a terrific day. Namely, Ann Tyson, Marjorie, Jeff Maynard, Robin Slee and George Ferguson. And our helpers from the planning department, the council staff, Jack and Mitchell, thank you very much. You two boys have been great. Now, I'm not sure if the urn's still on, is it, ladies? I think there'd be a, a cup of tea or coffee if you'd like it and um, some snacks there too. And um, 
we usually have this uh, lecture every two years, don't we? A biennial lecture. But COVID has messed about with the timings and I think we're going to have one next year, aren't we? No? Oh, we're on target. OK. So it will be two years before we can look forward to another one. And in between times, we might have some cultural heritage awards, which uh, works in between that time slot. Great. Well, thank you again for coming, and I'm sure you have enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Thank you.